Screen off. Okay, do you see my slides now? It's perfect now. Thank you. Great. Thanks for checking that. Okay, so this is just my second slide. So when we're going to talk about taper tonight, we're going to talk about two things actually. Uh, one of it is the actual taper, which is your reduction of your asset purchases. And then the second one is actually your interest rate hikes. So just to summarize what's been happening recently, they've been the Federal Reserve has been talking about a reduction in asset purchases, and they are quite insistent that a rate hike is not coming. So maybe we'll cover that later. Uh, but to begin with, so what we are looking at here is actually more or less the interest rates. So if you look at the past 50 years, right, you can see that interest rates are on a seeming downtrend of sorts. So uh, you wouldn't, prob you probably wouldn't want to pay too much attention to these because this is a period where actually inflation went to like 10%, 12%. So that was a pretty extraordinary time. Uh, so what you're looking at is probably more of a trend line that's something like that. Okay, so rates. So looking at the past 20 years, right, it hasn't really gone 10, 20 years, it hasn't really gone above 2.5%. So with that kind of backdrop in mind, right, you know, where can rates go from here? First note that it's all at zero. So, I mean, we're not going to talk about negative rates. So this simplifies our task in the sense that we're not going to think about rates going down, we're going to think about rates going up and what that means. Um, the more you learn about this topic, the more you realize that that's actually quite an important distinction there, that rates can't go down. So the interesting thing to me about this cycle, as it were, so just take a while to look at this chart. Uh, what you're seeing on the top is actually your rates here. And then what you see below here is your unemployment rate. So back then, you what happened when uh, there was actually a rate hike was that rates were hiked at around 5.1% unemployment. Why is that significant? You can see interest rate hikes as a kind of, uh, is the proxy is like this. When the economy is doing well, they kind of want to, it's like a horse, they pull it back, they don't want it to go too fast, so they raise rates and then it's supposed to crimp some sort of uh, your consumption, your lending activity. So what's happening here is that 5.1% employment or 5% unemployment is actually what economists will call your natural unemployment rate for the USA. So when it comes to around 5.1% unemployment, the regulators will start thinking about, hey, we need to slow down the economy, otherwise you overheat. And why are they concerned about overheating? That's because of inflation. But of course, I'm not going to talk too much about inflation uh, today because it's, it could be a whole other topic. But if you have any burning questions about inflation, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, questions will be answered even after this uh, webinar. So. You can see that here is 5.1% unemployment, but what do we see in the most recent unemployment statistics? Right now, it's actually at 5.2%. So people are a bit panicky right now. They're like, okay, he's probably going to raise rates pretty soon because it's the same as back then. Um, that may not be entirely accurate. I think there's still some runway. Why is that so? Jerome Powell himself is very adamant that he's not going to raise rates until certain metrics are met. And it's not actually this metric anymore. What he's looking at is actually your unemployment and wage growth by ethnicity, gender, things like that. So what if those aren't met, it's what he calls his dashboard of labor economic indicator, labor indicators. So if those aren't met, he's probably not going to want to uh, taper too fast or even raise rates. So got to keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that if next month you see that it goes to 5.1%, then straight away it's going to raise rates. Could go for slightly further because of what I mentioned just now. So actually, if we look at so these two are just now what I showed. Then this third one is actually uh, perhaps what you guys may have seen before uh, on this topic, which is uh, your asset purchases. So for asset purchases, right, how do you read this kind of chart? When it's flat, it's actually still considered expansion, which means the Federal Reserve is buying up your treasuries. So what happens here, right, is that when it's flat, this expansion, but only when the, this graph starts going down, because I compressed it, you can't really see the curve as well. But only when it starts going down, then you're seeing that uh, you can see there's a withdrawal of support from the Federal Reserve. So that's what uh, they famously coined the uh, taking away the punch bowl while the party is still going on, uh, taper tantrum, things like that, taper tantrum which happened earlier. So actually what we can see is that uh, your tapering is probably going to lead your interest rate hikes first 
just because if you look at this, uh, this response has been entirely unprecedented. I think at the beginning of the crisis, nobody expected the Federal Reserve to actually step in and go from 3 trillion, how you read this, 3 trillion to actually 8 trillion now. I think when 7 trillion people are panicking, but now it's at 8 and it's kind of the new norm of sorts. So the taper is definitely first on the agenda. And then after that is the interest rate hikes. So this has kind of some interesting effects. Maybe I'll talk briefly about the bond yield, kind of what's going on there. So if I were to begin with that, so you can see that COVID is actually from here onwards. But even before COVID, you were seeing that actually bond yields, uh, they were trapped sort of below 2%. How you read that is actually, it's a flight to bonds when there's a lot of economic uncertainty. So you can see it's coming off like at least for the last few years. Uh, this is not part of a longer term trend. But for the last few years, it's been coming down that way. So bond yields and 2%. So right now, a lot of people are making, uh, how you say, predictions. Uh, uh, they are sort of uh, taking sides. Is it going to go to 2%? Is it going to come to 1.4%? But where does it go from here? I think a simple way, uh, not, ac not fully accurate way to look at it is if you believe that the US economy is going to uh, continue its recovery and continue uh, strengthening, then yes, your bond yields would probably go up because uh, it's a flight from bonds then. Uh, so why is this important, right? Is uh, because, I mean, the topic of the night in the end, I think people want to link it to investments and bond yields are important for investments. Why? I can give you an example here, which is how do you, one way you can actually use bond yields to uh, do a bit of uh, snooping around, uh, shopping even, if, if, if you like, is that, so this is your 10-year bond yield here. And when your 10-year bond yields, actually uh, higher than your earnings yields of say your NASDAQ, S&P and your Dow Jones, right? What you're actually saying is simply translated is that your bond yields are just better deal for your money than anything from the NASDAQ. So if the, the bond yields keep rising, valuations on the NASDAQ keep uh, going up, therefore pushing down your earnings yields. Uh, I would say you're going to see a lot of uh, how it works is a lot of institutional investors actually do look at this and say that, hey, actually your NASDAQ is kind of expensive versus everything else. Uh, NASDAQ being a proxy for growth stocks, technology stocks. So this is actually something that would happen pretty quick. So on to the rest of uh, what we're going to talk about today, um, just to segment the discussion. So let's say we look at the dollar. I think there's some interesting observations or obvious observations to make about the dollar first. So the dollar longer term you are seeing that it's actually on a, it's making like higher lows of sorts, which I think a lot of people like to point out nowadays as well. <clears throat> and a lot of that, uh, in my view at least, I think this is an, uh, an opinion, uh, not so much of a fact these days, that uh, it's a lot to do with asset purchasing over the years. Um, so, but one thing that uh, needs to be said. So that was more about asset purchases, right? So now if you look at interest rates, I think the general wisdom, I mean, I came from just your standard junior college economics to university economics. I think the standard wisdom they, they would dispense uh, is that if you increase interest rates, no matter where you are, you will straight away get appreciation in your currency. You can actually see here that it's not so clear cut. Uh, Whenever there's a tightening, tightening being that you raise your rates. When you raise your rates, you expect it to go up, right? But it doesn't. You see it here, it doesn't. Here, here, I mean, I'm not going to labor the point, but you can see that the relationship is not so clear cut. Uh, what takeaways you have from this is that if you, if you are going to do a trade, specifically, hey, there's a rate hike coming. Uh, in, I was taught in university or somebody told me on the street that interest rates rise and therefore uh, your currency will rise. And that isn't really the case. There are some differences that I'll elaborate later. However, what is interesting is, I think one older observation that perhaps some viewers may not know is that um, there's a, ch what my words, uh, chop that comes right after a rate hike. So the dollar actually tends to see a small slump right after a rate hike. And I think how, how people can think about it and uh, spoken to some of my peers about it as well is that it is you can see this as a bit of a profit taking if, if you like so you know you would 
how you imagine it is uh, in anticipation of rate hike because how do they telegraph rate hikes nowadays and i use the word telegraph intentionally so previously perhaps you're talking about decades ago when they did rate hikes it's just very sudden overnight you know it's just a rate hike but now you can see Jerome Powell he's he's taking extreme pains not to startle the market he says it's coming it's coming he tells you half a year in advance is coming it's coming so when it finally lands it's already priced in so what you're seeing now is that you know before a rate hike so let's say if the rate hike is here you're going to see the dollar go up go up go up and then after that, when it comes to the actual hike itself, then you're going to see some profit taking action down this way. It's not a guaranteed thing. You do see some divergences here and there. But by and large, on the exact dates here, you, can do, you do see some minor movements downwards. So I think uh, I would recommend do your own research here because uh, some of these movements are pretty large. Uh, but this is at least one of the more interesting observations about uh, near-term rate hikes. So again, uh, back to the first thing I said, it's, uh, actually your asset purchases are the first to get reduced so there's no talk of a firm date for a rate hike yet but like i said he's been talking about it so it's probably going to come soon and linking back to what i said about the unemployment rate uh it's they are near net uh, they are near their full employment level so i i think a rate hike would probably have to come sooner than later so if that was more of the short term view of the dollar, right? So if we take a medium term view of, uh, say, the Fed is trying to raise rates from zero to 2.5%, right? We call, let's say we term that between you and I, we term that as a kind of a, their program where they're trying to increase rates. So they don't increase rates from zero to 2.5, right? They do it by 0 0.25, 0 0.25%. So, you know, over this period of time, you can see that the relationship is, uh, my words, is unclear. You can see that, you know, it starts higher and then it comes out lower. And when it's, when the rates are going down, you can see that, you know, it's just, it's just what, you, how to say, it's not a sure play. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, but it's definitely not a sure play. There's a lot of other factors in play. Um, and there's a lot to do with, just people reading other metrics as well. So your inflation, your labor, your... Uh, so this one here, if I may find my cursor, right, that is. So this one here, um, not to offend the sensibilities of anyone, but this is what some people will call the Trump slump, uh, where he was purposely kind of trying to talk down the dollar of sorts. So uh, you can see his success to some degree, you know, here. So definitely, you know, you can come in and say that, okay, uh, the Fed's going to have their program of raising rates, therefore I'm going to adopt my medium term position on, on the dollar where it's going to appreciate and then in comes Trump, you know, maybe you're a fan, maybe you're not, you know, it doesn't really matter, but in comes Trump and he's going to he's gonna put an end to your plans as it were. So I would say, you know, short term is unclear, medium term is unclear. So, you know, what can we really be sure of? Um, actually, what I think research from... Uh, some some of the central banks, particularly the Federal Reserve and its uh, subsidiaries, right? Um, a lot of the research shows that actually, <laughs> short term and near term, there's really no way to tell which direction it's going to go. There's a proper term for it, which I'll cover in a bit. Um, and you know what they do think is that it's more to do with a macro macroeconomic fundamentals. Like, do you have a view on which way the domestic economy is going to go? And do you have a view of the domestic debt economies, trading partners, their major partners, uh, emerging market currencies, how are they going to do uh, against the US dollar? So that has a lot more to do uh, medium and longer term. Uh, as for shorter term, if I could, may go to the summary here, you can see that actually one by one, if I were to go through, is most people do expect the dollar to rise. This is uh, actually wrong. If you've been listening, this is wrong um when rates rise especially this is not a guarantee uh and the reason for that is you know you, you expect for one reason at least is you expect your carry trades to unwind so research backed by the federal reserve is that you know your high interest rate currency so let's say your chinese yuan is uh, at a higher rate now it's probably three over three percent uh it tends not to depreciate against low interest rate currencies that are hiking rates what that means is if the us dollar rises you're not going to see suddenly a lot of people running from the Chinese yuan to the US dollar like that. That's what they're saying. So in the short term, the term used 
favored by the Federal Reserve is that it's actually it's a random walk. So how do you think of a random walk? It's, it's like a you know an arcade machine where you drop a coin at the top and it goes 50-50 chance left or right. That's literally what they're saying. So within a set parameter, right, they really don't know which direction it's going to go. And that's to the best efforts of a lot of people doing financial modeling for currencies. Uh, IMF themselves actually shows that, you know, it is a random walk, more or less. Uh, but the thing is, when it comes to more of a macro view, like a medium term, longer term, that tends to play out better when they are doing their predictions. So that one's smart. What if I'm saying anything at all, it tends to be more qualitative than quantitative. Uh, interest rates and pairing of asset purchases, that's not going to be a sure play. So equities, uh, if I'm going to talk about equities and rates are high, so not so much of asset purchases yet, right? So just to get right into it, I'm not going to start with the broad indexes. I'm going to, so what you're looking at is your S&P 500. So that's your blue line versus your sub index, which is your S&P financials. So actually what, uh, what you can observe here is, uh, let's say this rate hike program starts here, 2015, it ends here, 2018. What you're seeing is that, you know, for the longest time, actually your financials have been underperforming uh, the broader S&P index. But once your rate hikes start kicking in, particularly after the first rate hike, you can see that actually there's a gap here between financials and then it widens. But towards the end, it kind of tapers off and then you see financials going back to its, uh, it depends on who you ask, the rightful place below the broader index. So uh, I think this is uh, self-evident if you see, see the charts. So this is a zoomed out view. So S&P financials, it tends to outperform only during periods of rising rates. So what you're seeing is that, uh, again, how you read this is blue line versus orange line. Blue line above means here is S&P, it wins out. Here you're looking at financials winning out. And then once your interest rates have finished rising of sorts, here you're looking at S&P winning out again. So I think this is a pretty interesting observation to me at least, um, which I would summarize towards the end. Uh, one more observation I'll make is that, you know, so how I'll compare this is, right now we're here, and this is a terribly large gap between the S&P and the, uh, um, S&P sub index of financials so there's a gap here and where I see it right is that it seems to me that we are somewhere here as well in the sense we are before your rate hikes okay so the main question to me um, I'm not saying that it will happen but the main question to me is this gap going to narrow again now that you know definitely you are going to think about not keeping your interest rates uh, totally flat uh, in the coming years at least so um, if you're going to watch a recording of this, or you're going to take a screenshot of this, you know, these are some of the ideas at least. So these are the top constituents, constituents of the finance index and also to get a better idea of, you know, what business are the constituents of the sub-index in. So I'm going to move ahead to others. So um, to summarize what we've gone through so far for equities is firstly, you have your finance outperforming S&P but only with a very strict set of parameters and only for a limited window of time. Uh, and then when it comes to that, financials do experience a surge, but they actually outperform by other sectors anyway. So what sectors are that? It's your information technology and your consumer discretionary, these two. Uh, you can see what the, what the constituents are in here. And I think any analyst can give you any number of reasons why these companies are going to do well. Uh, because what am I talking about? These are companies like Apple, Amazon, Tesla, which only got included like within the last couple of years, last year, last couple of years. Uh, so Microsoft, Nvidia, Visa, so these are more high growth or they're literally just growth uh, stocks. So no matter how well, two observations for me at least, no matter how well financials do during this uh, interest rate period, interest rate hike period, um, Apologies, there's a hike. Uh, yes, so no matter how well they do during this period, right? They, it's not going to see, how you say, you're not going to see financial suddenly pull ahead of the rest of the pack. Interestingly to me, you actually see growth stocks do well as well. And uh, to me, how, what, how to interpret that is actually, um, if some of the viewers will recall, at some points earlier in the year, when bond yields, Bond yields actually went up. You were looking at people kind of uh, 
worry about inflation, bond yields, things like that. So actually what was happening there was that uh, inflation, just to focus on inflation, inflation erodes the future earnings of growth, for instance. And what in interest rate hikes do is they chip, it chips away at inflation. You can think of it like that. It chips away at inflation and that's actually kind of bullish for growth stocks, among other things. So interestingly to me, uh, no matter how well financials did, you can see that actually growth stocks still do better. So that, however, is not a cast iron guarantee when it comes to future interest rate hikes. So definitely have some caution going into it. But uh, if anything, if I'm saying anything at all, it's uh, don't be too quick to fall in love with financial stocks uh, just because. But uh, they could offer a good short term opportunity. So when it comes to equities here, uh, this is my summary of sorts. So stocks in general, when you compare them to other assets like your bonds, cash, um, they do tend to continue doing well in the medium term, despite uh, which di whichever direction your tapers or your interest rate hikes or cuts go. So in the short term, really in the short term, and with those caveats that I've mentioned many, many times previously, uh, financial team companies do tend to do better. It does bleed away very, very quickly. So, I mean, if you're looking to enter a position, that could be a good, my words, uh, it could be a good period to pick some up before, pick some up after, if it's a real long-term position. But in between, you're going to see, at the very least, quite a lot of volatility in financial stocks. So growth stocks, finally, growth stocks do tend to do better anyway than financial stocks. So, you know, that's for you to assess. Um, perhaps on to the final uh, asset class I'm going to talk about before we can dive into some Q&A perhaps is uh, how does gold do? So I think this one is quite, uh, not say very counterintuitive. So when your interest rates do rise, right, gold tends to stagnate. I think that's kind of a, more or less a consensus across the board. Uh, interest rates cut, then your goal tends to, or how you say, when your interest rate regime isn't as oppressive, my words, uh, then you do tend to see gold kind of rally. So if we compare that to actually your asset pur purchases, right, you can see that um, these are what I would deem more like, say, mildly uh, explanatory events when it comes to the price of gold. So definitely you do see these days here, especially this red box, if I call your attention here, um, gold prices are being affected uh, intraday by a lot of uh, expectations of a taper or not. So what do I mean? Let's say if a job report comes out and what we saw was last Friday's job report, it came out 235,000 created jobs versus 720,000 expected. So that's negative. Of course, everybody wants more jobs. What this means, however, is Jerome Powell can keep his money printers on for another month, perhaps. So that is actually kind of bullish for gold in that sense. So short term, you're going to see these kind of uh, movements in gold. But of course, you've got to think longer term, which direction is it going to go? Will this taper last forever? And will interest rates remain at 0% forever? Probably not. So if I were to go to the uh, conclusion of sorts for gold is that, I mean, I, I do understand that there's plenty of uh, bullish reasons out there to believe or a lot of analyses that says that gold will probably go to 2000 or more um, in the same way that uh, within the same breath as, you know, we need inflation hedges, we need a kind of a new asset class, like some people mentioned cryptocurrencies, for instance, uh, inflation is here, therefore we need a hedge, therefore these, the price of these instruments will go up. But historically speaking, I mean, if your interest rates are going to go up, and your asset purchases are going to scale back. That tends to be quite bearish for gold. So I think there need a, needs to be quite some caution there when it comes to gold. And US dollar wise, I wouldn't say this is a very major point, but you can see the interaction of the US dollar with gold. And uh, when US dollar is kind of uh, weakening, you do see gold going, uh, having its own minor rally. And uh, I think most people wouldn't really I would say the balance of analysis out there would be actually to do expect a bit more of a bullish environment for the US dollar. Again, inverse relationship. So again, that's a bearish pressure on gold. So that would be my analysis of three different asset classes. Uh, yeah, and 
I would have more to say, but perhaps Sri, if I may call upon you, if you have any questions from the audience. Hi, Morris. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, can hear you clearly. Okay. Um, uh, first one is, uh, what do you think of investing opportunities in Chinese stock sector right now? Chinese stocks. Um, I would think for Chinese stocks, uh, let me see if I have. Uh, hold on now. Uh, yes. So I did prepare some supplementary slides in case. Uh, and this was from some other uh, webinar I did. Um, but um, Chinese stocks now. I would think when it comes to okay, so maybe my first observation is that your when it comes to currencies, uh, what you're seeing now is that people are favoring the the yuan over the dollar uh, for people who care about such things. So you would expect to see some sort of reversion in that trade when your U.S. interest rates rise. For Chinese stocks, right? Um, I think there are two main trends going on right now. Firstly, is what you see on this slide. There are several sell-offs, and this is kind of uh, scared away a lot of foreign investors, right? But you know, this is just I think uh, quite a few analysts have pointed this out as well. Is that you know this is just par for the course, if you like, or this is business as usual for Chinese stocks here, here, here. So you're looking at 2015, 2018, things like that. But the key thing to note is that every single time it's taken years for it to recover the previous levels. So based on history, what I'm saying, if you know if you enter the position here, then it might take a while. Um, but some other things that I would note for Chinese stocks perhaps is that um, the current sell-off, I think uh, perhaps some people would have overlooked the earnings season of the tech giants as well. I think uh, if anyone is interested in those stocks, right, um, they provide a very good... So if I were to bring it back to a bit more of the topic, you try to compare the two, right? Uh, compare, say, US stocks, other emerging market stocks versus Chinese stocks. I think Chinese big, large cap uh, stocks offer earnings growth that you can't really see anywhere else. Um, I'm not saying it's the best, but definitely uh, you're not really going to see a company with a market cap in billions and billions and billions, and then they're going to have a profit earnings growth of like say 30, 40, 50%. But that being said, right, I mean, what we are seeing here, at least in the near term, at least what I can say for the near term is that um, what they seem to be facing themselves is that uh, uh, there are signs that the economy is slowing down, or I wouldn't even say slowing down, it's still really, really huge, but uh, not meeting expectations, which is a, it's a typically Asian thing to say, right? But uh, it isn't meeting expectations in a sense. So there are some expectations of a more accommodative, supportive monetary policy, uh, which actually would go counter interestingly. So you're seeing the whole world in the sense of Korea, New Zealand, was supposed to uh usa europe uh the central european central bank japan they're all thinking about tightening but here because china is slowing down they're thinking of loosening their monetary policy so whenever you hear the word loosening of monetary policy then for equities that's naturally going to be like huh you're going to think about equities going up so near term i think look out for that i'm not saying it's a sure play but uh it offers an interesting opportunity for those of you already thinking about macro policy because of this divergence, Chinese versus rest of the world, just because their recovery has been so much earlier than everyone else. All right, yeah. Maurice, we have a few more questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Benson. He's asking, what is your view if we are holding TLT, long-term treasuries, as a hedge? Do you think 10-year interest rates will rise or fall, or will the Taper with the slowing growth. Will the Fed taper with slowing growth? Yeah. Right, right. Uh, so that's interesting to to think about. Uh, let me see, let me see. Fed taper with slowing growth. Okay, 
maybe if I start with the last uh, point first, and Sri, I may need your help to re help me recall the first few. But if I go to say this. Pardon me while I look for my slide. Um, interest rate staller. Um, maybe I'll talk and look for it at the same time. So, um, taper and slowing growth. So I think the interesting thing is now there's a, a lot of talk about needing, I would say, or rather it's like an under the table kind of talk to me, my words, about there's very limited wriggle room for macro policy when it comes to a, uh, your QE, so-called. Because what are you seeing? You're seeing your rates are already zero. You're seeing your asset purchases are probably as high as they can go. Um, and for now, at least. So the issue for them is, you know, you can't lower it anymore to actually stimulate consumption. And you're seeing other metrics, like, for example, your velocity of money is actually coming in super, super low. So they are thinking about other things um right now you're seeing again it's raising its head again of uh so usually your inflation rate targeting is coming in at two percent right so actually they're thinking about raising it to three four percent i'm not too sure how strong that argument is uh usually in tough times it raises its head every now and then but given how low interest rates are and still the economy isn't performing to how they want in some regards at least uh they probably would start thinking about that so the first thing to think about for if that's kind of scenario plays out, right, is you're looking at a more uh, longer term, uh, longer term period of time where you're expecting higher inflation. So then your standard argument, uh, your standard kind of considerations of what does well in a high inflationary environment, what doesn't do well in a high inflationary environment, those kind of things start to kick in. Uh, if I then for the first part of the question, which would be more of like. Uh, bonds in your portfolio right now if i'm not mistaken uh which is to do with your longer term yields i think there are some uh, pretty accessible products out there i'm guessing like the the etfs to do with your above 20 year maturity bonds those kind uh i had a look at the numbers i can't offer too much on that to be completely honest with you but i had a look at the numbers and try to find a relationship at least for this presentation to try to find a relationship between uh uh, inflation interest rates and inflation interest rates and your asset purchases with that right and i think they do tend to provide a good way to really keep your money there but it doesn't really have a positive or inverse correlation it just doesn't seem to be very correlated at all if you ask me um i think right now at this point of time what a lot of people are thinking about is uh, or at least for institutional where you can see the flows at least i can offer that is that a lot of it is actually going to treasury inflated uh, treasury your treasury protected bonds treasury inflated treasury infl uh, protected bonds um i'm still in a bit of puzzlement when it comes to that because what you're actually thinking if i were to summarize the whole debate going on in the macro world now it seems to be that uh, deflation is more of an issue and everyone's kind of confident that the federal reserve can actually control inflation so that would actually be not so bullish for for your bonds the shorter du shorter maturity bonds in, in that sense it's um for longer term yeah i wouldn't be able to offer too much on that it's just i couldn't find a relationship when i was preparing for this uh for this presentation uh was there a second question in there Sri? like another part to it it's about whether the fed will slow down no, asset purchases? Yeah. All right. Uh, that one, if I could just cover that real quick, all right. Um, I think would be able to think about that question here. Uh, yes, here. Here. Uh, I think the when it comes to taper plus interest rate, at least in my opinion, it a lot of it will have to do, will come down to your labor market indicators. So not so much of how is your, your housing starts, your GDP growth, your other things are coming. Um, my, my reason for that is actually, 
it seems to me that um, it's a bit more of a not say not to say ideological issue but a lot of them do have experiences with the 08 crisis and 2013 when they, they caused a bit of a taper tantrum so the observations or the language they've adopted is they want to learn from the experience of 08 particularly um, where they withdrew support too early in their words they withdrew support too early and then they saw very uneven recovery in the economy so it's actually very clear that Jerome Powell has mentioned many many times um, and people around him have mentioned also many, many times that they are going to wait for a broad-based recovery. And what, and they actually mean it, interestingly to me, they actually mean it in the way that they have indicators they are tracking. So again, 5.1%, this is a danger zone for people in terms of well, the moment you hit 5.1%, it goes, okay, inflation is going to start coming. But, you know, Jerome Powell, he's looking at the 2013 when they started uh, doing talking about the taper, right? Um, that it was just way too early and a lot of people got left out of the economic growth that come, came afterwards. So that would be my thoughts on the taper. It's going to come, but not, not as soon as people think probably. Hey, Maurice, uh, we have a question from Fabian. He's asking, in your earlier slides, the probability of the US rate hike cycles usually bring about better US equity performances. How does emerging markets fit into the picture with, uh, with US rate hikes? And how does the Chinese common prosperity complicate matters further? Chinese, uh, pardon, but Chinese what prosperity? The Chinese common prosperity is what they are driving at right now. How will this uh, fit into the grand scheme of things? Right, right. Um, I think first, first what you're going to see uh, in the near term, perhaps, half answering the question right is uh, you're looking at kind of a catch-up game when it comes to emerging markets uh that's happening now so a bit less to do with probably rate, rate hikes in my opinion at least so it's a lot to do with uh, things like vaccine access so you're talking about say china it's so interestingly china without the uh, proper va vaccine thresholds my words um they have been able to kind of reopen their economy right uh, but what you're seeing in a lot of uh, emerging market economies is actually other emerging market economies because China is an emerging market economy uh, is that they haven't had full access to vaccines yet and therefore what you're looking at is there is still a rotation yet to come from the more developed countries which have uh, already 60, 70, 50 percent vaccines there's still rotation to come into emerging markets so that comes with obvious flows in whichever currencies um, I think that will be a bigger short-term movement than, say, uh, rate hikes for the question being how will the rate hike or how will the taper affect uh, this US equities and emerging markets, right? I think near term, yeah, vaccines will be more of a thing. Um, and I may miss the question in the middle, but the last part, I definitely caught it now. It's about common prosperity. Uh, common prosperity, I think the honest answer to it is really nobody knows. Uh, nobody knows the extent of where it's going to go, but at least near term, some milder things I can tell you, at least uh, in case anyone missed it, is that one is the how people are interpreting it. One is the Beijing SME stock exchange that's coming up. The other one is actually uh, the vice premier. Uh, Liu He coming out, he he said that you know uh, private companies are here to stay. So when it comes to that, um, how people are interpreting it really for the near term is that perhaps the worst is over. But to be honest, I think um, honest answer is there hasn't really been anything like this to this scale, and nobody knows when it's going to end. Because uh, I mean, what the most extreme example has really happened, which is your overnight, they kind of banned uh, private education for profit, right? So it's like you're talking about a speeding vehicle where even our sovereign wealth funds have positions in it. And then all of a sudden, it seemed to have hit a brick wall and went from like 100 kilometers per hour to zero straight like that. If they can do that, they can really do anything. Uh, that being said, that being said, I think it is in the their interest to actually, uh, I would say, bring back foreign flows into the country in the sense that they are, are actually trying to open up uh, their capital markets to foreign investors 
So you can see a lot of investment thesis flying out there now that you know it's a great time to buy, it's a great time to, to re-enter positions in Chinese equities. But that being said, uh, this isn't the first time it's happened. And again, if I go back to that final final slide, um, here, which is this isn't the first time it's happened. So if you talk about it purely from a return perspective, uh, not so much a qual qualitative perspective, these are very nice U shapes. And I mean, perhaps uh, I did come from a consulting background. So uh, I mean, uh, sometimes you see a V-shaped recovery, right? Uh, perhaps not. Perhaps it take a while. Um, I think any any hopes that people have of uh, oh the worst is over, the bottom is in, maybe a bit premature still. Uh, still doesn't hurt to really think about a company as large and growing as fast as say Pinduoduo or Alibaba you're looking at like 30, 40, 50% revenue growth in very high tech areas. It really doesn't hurt to think about these companies are cheap. Uh, that's a fact. But as to what goes on in the Politburo's mind, nobody knows. So that's as best I can give. Yeah. What was there another part to the question, Sri? Um, well, let's see. Fabian's questions. Uh, the first one is how does emerging markets fit into the picture and the second one is how does the chinese common prosperity uh complicate methods further mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have a couple of questions on uh, emerging markets do you want to pick up the next one yeah sure i'll give it a go okay, just give me a second okay Um, okay, this is related in the next, uh, this is from Stephen. Stephen is asking in the next six to 12 months, which region offers higher opportunity in terms of stocks, stock price appreciation, uh, US or China? What's your view? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for narrowing it down to just the two. Uh, I would think US stocks right now, if I start with US stocks, um, Perhaps instead of giving a direct answer, uh, I would start saying that US stocks right now, the psychology you need to adopt definitely is that you're investing at an all-time high. Um, and when you're investing at an all-time high, you need to be aware that uh, it's just, it goes without saying that it's a bit dangerous in a sense. So if I may find a suitable proxy, perhaps. Uh, Pardon me while I look for it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, maybe this one can give a nice overview. This was just a couple of days ago. So, if you're looking at S&P, you're looking at US stocks in general, right? You're looking at them coming in at all-time high. You're looking at the valuations for a lot of US stocks being very, very high. Um, there are two observations to be made from that. Is uh, Firstly, obviously, it's, it's, um, it's above the its usual averages. So for usual averages, right? So that comes with the second observation. For it to go back to the average, because that's why it's an average, right? Your kind of. So either your price has to come down or your earnings have to keep up. And what a lot of people on the street are saying is that your earnings have to keep up. Because a lot of it has to do with the recent earnings season, which was quite uh, extraordinary, uh, or at least the best ever. So because of that, a lot of uh, analysts have upgraded their price targets and, you know, it's, everything's bullish, bullish, bullish. Um, so there's two things that's happening there. First is actually their earnings per share on average, right? Uh, many of the forecasts on if you aggregate it, it's actually calling for by Q4 next year, you're going to see uh, something like 50% increase in earnings per share across the board in, uh, say, S&P, which to me it stretches belief quite a bit uh, because you're seeing that, I mean, you're seeing an economic slowdown. You're seeing that you know there's there's a lot of issues that needs to be ironed out, uh, and it's for example uh, Delta variant and whatever comes after Delta variant. Of course, I mean who knew such a thing would happen? And there's so much uncertainty in a sense. So to be calling for 50% upside just a year from now, to be honest, if you look at the EPS growth, earnings per share growth of uh, U.S. stocks right now, or pre historical EPS growth, right? it doesn't do this 50% thing very often. So you have to believe, what I'm saying is that you have to believe in the climate of COVID is still around. Uh, the Federal Reserve is going to withdraw their so-called easy monetary policy. And uh, 
under whatever geopolitical concerns the US government has at the time, you have to believe that your stocks can actually outperform in the next year at current valuations. I can't give you a definite recommendation, buy, sell, you know, things like that, but definitely it stretches belief that uh, this party is going to continue. Uh, to answer the question directly, I think upside is limited in the sense purely on a valuation perspective. But this year, for people who have been following the market every day, you know that valuation it's nowadays is not the only way to look at stocks. Uh, for Chinese stocks, um, I think what the main answer has to come from is what is the actual pre political risk premium you're talking about for Chinese stocks. And again, uh, it's, at least in my lay view, uh, and really this is, would be a lay view, is, it's, uh, I wouldn't know what the political risk premium is. I think a lot of people also don't know what the political risk premium is because we don't know the scope of the kind of crackdown there is. What I can tell you is that they are keen to have uh, foreign investors in as well. So, and if I were to single out some areas that hopefully don't get missed by people following Chinese stocks is that uh, they did come out with a five-year plan and the five-year plan does have named industries that they are hoping to cultivate. And by cultivate, they are talking about building regions, they're building factories, they're building infrastructure to support it. And you're talking a lot about green technologies. So that goes all the way from your electro electronic, electric vehicles, your batteries, your uh, semiconductor stocks, your clean power, things like that. So it's going to get state support. Uh, whether you're going to see the same kind of like, uh, uh, I mean, so I think the past year in Chinese stocks, you've seen a lot of bad behavior companies, my words. Um, they started off as something and then they branch off into too many things. And then it's always a case of regulator says, hey, weren't you supposed to do that? Why are you doing this now? And then they crack down. So I'm not going to name names, but that's usually what happens, right? So maybe you're going to see in the future, your battery stock suddenly does micro lending, you know, who knows? But uh, what I'm saying is that these companies probably are going to have a bit more free reign than your traditional uh, big cap names, like uh, say, say Alibaba or things like that, right? Where already the regulator, the regulatory eye is already on them. So I think Chinese stocks do have upside, but the upside would perhaps be found in what the five-year plan outlines, um, purely for the fact that the regulatory risk premium in the those areas is probably going to be a bit less. As to whether regulators will crack down on market power, then I'm not so sure. Um, certainly, I would say yes, but to what extent, I wouldn't know. Because it is in their interest if they want a strong uh, exportable kind of industry and players, right? They can't crack down way too much on it. Uh, they do have to give some leeway, um, some elbow room, if you like, for these companies to operate. Yeah, so perhaps you can look at that. Um, so again, US stocks valuations are really too high. Uh, they're a bit too optimistic. Uh, Chinese stocks, not everything's going to be a winner, I feel, just because nobody knows where it's going to go in terms of political risk. Yeah, hopefully that answers that. Hey, Maurice. So we have uh, a question on the Singapore bank sector. Um, according to, well, Bobby was saying that he felt the US banks are quite fully valued right now versus mm -hmm. the Singapore banks. In your view of financials, uh, in your view, uh, will financials outperform when rates rise? Are Singapore banks preferred? versus US banks? Singapore banks, uh, I think the thesis for investment for Singapore stocks in general tends to be more of like a value investing, uh, you want more of a bit of an income. Uh, but if I may refer to my apologies for flipping quickly. Here perhaps. Um, so real quick, how I would say, how I'd approach this is, I mean, first thing first is that, um, or rather from here, yes, I'll start from here, is that uh, when the market starts anticipating a rate hike, you're going to see that's when the, the party starts for financials in a sense. Um, and when I mean the party, I don't mean that it just goes up. Here it's also going up, right? But, you know, the broader stock market is also going up. So for financials specifically, that's when the party starts. But you can see that the party is is just a very rough party. Yeah. It's um, for any number of reasons you like. Uh, so 
in my view, when it comes to financials, it's more of like, a, at least in with the backdrop of interest rates will rise, right? It's uh, going to be a more, bit more short-term play, long-term play, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, definitely, they will do better when interest rates rise. But the thing is, whatever you're thinking about now, interest rates rising, right, is how you say, their market participants in general have already known this for about half a year or a year in a sense. So actually, in my just my own opinion, I think some element of interest rate hikes are already priced into current financial stocks in the US at least. Um, reason being, you know, there was really never any way that you were going to see rates stay at zero all the way. Uh, so there's that. I think there's going to be kind of limited upside. If anything, you're going to see the financials going to be quite sticky to the broader index, which again calls in a question. Like, so why are you investing in this rather than the broader index, right? Um, but if I were to compare US versus Singapore stocks, I think Singapore stocks in general or Singapore financials, uh, my words, you probably can't go too wrong there. Um, they're doing well across a lot of different segments. They're growing. Um, some of them, they're innovating pretty well in terms of uh, they're going into new areas. So for example, cryptocurrencies, that kind of thing. So uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting growth to read about. But that aside, right, I think one thing weighing them down currently is that, uh, just my opinion, but in the macroeconomic environment in Singapore is kind of lacking a bit of uh, good news in that sense. It's like a lot of good news is really out, what's next. And the what's next to me is is what is weighing a lot of stock sentiment down right now. Um, yes, we're seeing that GDP growth projections keep getting revised upwards, but what's in that number? Uh, recently, we did see that uh, unemployment rates rose slightly, uh, the components of which uh, that one we will have to see when the full year review comes out, for example, gig economy workers, those kind of aspects. Uh, foreign worker crunch, especially for your so-called K-shaped recovery sectors, which is the sectors that are doing worse, retail, hospitality, things like that, it's all weighing down on the economy. And it kind of, uh, how do you say, this, you can think of it as an equation, right? This part of the equation where it's macroeconomic equation contributing to the stock price. The macroeconomic side, domestic macroeconomy isn't really so hot right now. Uh, so near term, I mean, so then it comes to the question of do you think it's going to recover in the next six to 12 months, right? Uh, I think it will, but I do note that the years before COVID were not so hot for growth as well we were facing issues, we were talking about things like uh, labor crunch, there was nothing new. We were talking about things like, uh, you know, manufacturing driving the economy, we were talking about things like, you know, we need more skilled labor in certain areas. So those problems haven't gone away. If anything, it's got, gotten even worse. So in some ways, my words, so in some ways, you know, you have to have to think like, how much is that macroeconomic premium going to weigh down on the, the various stocks and I think it's going to weigh it down quite a bit. Um, that being said, fundamentally, uh, upside wise, I do think they have a bit more to go than your US stocks purely because for the US stocks, a lot of it has price, been priced in already. Yeah, that'll be my very low saw view on it at least. All right, uh, Maurice, I think this ties in with a nice uh, wrap up of your uh, presentation today. Uh, Colin is asking, um, what should we do to counter the foreseen inflation? Do to counter coming inflation? Um, I think, I mean, inflation wise, right now, if you look at, okay, I mean, uh, I just said this at another webinar, but bond traders are one face one facet of a bond trader is they are full-time kind of inflation gurus right and what they are saying now in general is that uh, inflation isn't an issue it's more of deflation why is that the case uh, it's a long story longer story but deflation used to be a problem before uh, covid as well so what i'm saying if i were to summarize in a sentence is people are believing in the fed right now again which is quite funny but um in the sense that they do trust that the Fed can control inflation. So you're going to see inflation come in 2, 2.5%, 3%. People are not going to care. 
bond traders are not going to care in a sense. That's why they're saying now. To be honest, I don't know if they're going to change their mind in a few months' time again, which they've done so a couple of times already. Um, just purely based on bond yields. But in terms of that, what that usually translate to, translates to right, is a stock market volatility or your various asset class volatility. Yeah. Um, two things maybe I can offer is that um, one is cash is not looking so bad right now, to be honest, um, from both a preservation or wealth perspective and also a kind of a, to adopt more younger language uh, by the dip mentality. So honestly, cash isn't looking so bad because uh, volatility. If I were to tie that into actually your overvalued state in general of the US stock market, then that's even better. Then when it comes to the other thing, wait, no, those were the two things. So when it comes to what else you should invest in during this period of time, uh, I think your traditional inflation hedges, right? Or at least what you read about a lot about in the news nowadays, it hasn't really played out. Um, not in the way people imagine. For example, cryptocurrencies, for example, gold. Uh, I would say that it's not such a clear-cut relationship. Uh, inflation rises and then you know you rush into whatever CNBC or Bloomberg tells you to buy as an inflation hitch. That that is not working out. Um, so one good thing to look into with me cash. The other one which perhaps, in my opinion, would actually do okay is actually stocks, which is uh, but the problem is which stocks, right? Uh, I think small caps would be worth your time. Uh, and small caps, particularly amongst growth. Uh, value small caps and value stocks in general, right? Um, is perhaps enough content to pump into another webinar. But those stocks are seeing their kind of so-called value premium uh, being chipped away over the years. So... In, when it comes to inflationary environment, they don't tend to do as well as growth um, and small cap. So small cap, I do think uh, worth your time to look into during this period of time. So small cap cash, that's perhaps what I offer. All right, thank you, Maurice, for the enlightening presentation. Uh, we have uh, some questions that were not answered. Uh, rest assured that Maurice will be looking at them uh, tomorrow and we'll provide our answers along with the follow-up email. And uh, thank you for being a wonderful audience. And thank you, Maurice. Thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Uh, uh, till our next webinar, have a good night and stay safe. Uh, if you have more questions for Maurice, be sure to type them down in the survey form right at the end of this webinar. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.